Now, I've been looking through the three books that, of yours, Jerry Kelly, that I'd like to talk about today, <laughs> but I can't, in any of them, find a nice little biography of you to read out, <laughs> which tells me something about you. Maybe you don't like people talking about you or yourself, or maybe well, okay, I'm reading yeah. too much into this. But well, let's start books, off, sorry, let's start off saying you are a world-renowned calligrapher, book designer, bibliophile, anything else? Well, I'm not world-renowned in anything else. I do, I do a little type design and I do a little writing. World-renowned sounds a bit highfalutin, but book design is my number one passion, what I'm most interested in. I started as a calligrapher, so calligraphy is like my first love. It is my first love. Yeah. And I still do some calligraphy, and I love calligraphy. And book design is what I put most of my efforts into, and every once in a while I write a book, and a few times I've done a typeface for my own perusal and use, but you know, some other people have those typefaces too, so that's what I do. I don't like to write about myself or speak about myself. Um, and these books that you have here about other subjects. They're not about me. Well, yes. Yeah, so we're not going to talk about you. Okay. Should uh, I leave now? No. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to talk about what you love and uh, what you're mm -hmm. interested in. So the first question is, how does calligraphy inform book design? Well, that's an interesting question. You know, my first reaction is that calligraphy informs type design mm -hmm. much more than book design. But at one point, we all know before 1455, all books were handwritten. And these calligraphers were mainly handwriting books. Most calligraphers were not doing uh, presentations of Robert Frost poems to put on the wall. They were doing books. And if you look at the revival of calligraphy, which was spearheaded by Edward Johnson in England and Rudolf Koch in Germany, and both of them wrote manuals early in the 20th century, very early, starting this revival of calligraphy. Both of them speak a lot about books, about manuscript books. Mm. So book design is a very interesting art. It's, and, and calligraphy was the way that I got into books. What does a calligraphy manual provide you with? Instruction, just like it says. So. But what? what? I mean, is, there, is there a right way to oh, do calligraphy? Oh, definitely. Sure, sure. There's better and worse calligraphy. And if you want to learn calligraphy, you have to have some model to follow and some instruction on how to hold the pen and the pen angle. So Edward Johnson wrote Writing and Illuminating and Lettering in 1906. He published it in 1906. And it's called The Calligrapher's Bible. And it is. And Nicholas Barker, that's a name that you're probably familiar with, Nicholas Barker wrote somewhere, I can't cite chapter and verse, that it is probably the best manual of any kind ever written. And it probably is. It's a very thorough manual. In Germany, Rudolf Koch wrote a book, Schrieb Kunst aus Kunstfertigkeit, which was uh, beautiful writing considered as an art. And, uh, and so both of those were manuals that a lot of people learned calligraphy from early in the revival of calligraphy, because calligraphy had a low ebb for a few centuries once printing caught on that wildfire. Mm -hmm. But anyway, calligraphy for books, you know, was the purpose of calligraphy. So a lot of the same criteria about margins, about type, about letter form sizes. I'm still not sure about this, though, because mm -hmm. is there a correct, quote-unquote, calligraphic style? There are many calligraphic styles, and there are better and worse examples of those styles. So let's say one thing about calligraphy, it's done with a broad edge pen. There mm -hmm. is pointed pen calligraphy too, but we'll put that aside for the moment. But most calligraphy is done with a broad edge pen. And you have to hold that at the right angle. Yeah. And there are different angles for different hands. And there's some manipulation of that pen. So all of this, it's valuable to be taught. So it sounds to me that this is quite a rigid science. It's not a science, it's an art, I would say. And rigid, okay. well... There is a conservative aspect to it because letter forms, it's fascinating about letter forms that they're very set. You cannot make, in a way, a different kind of lowercase c, a different kind of f. Yet within that very set parameter, 
there are hundreds of thousands of typefaces all with a different F and a different E. Right. And so that's an interesting challenge that it's a very rigid conservative, there's not much you could do to change the alphabet. Every once in a while people have tried that, to mm. come up with a new alphabet. I, I could tell you about several, but it never works. But you could find infinite expression in the alphabet, infinite. But you have to learn that alphabet, and you have to learn the principles. Um, I guess it's I'm hard still to not see. getting this though, because is there a right way to do a C in calligraphy or not? Because you're yes. saying there's hundreds of different. But there's infinite faces. variation. There's infinite variation right. within that right way to do the C. If I if I make a C, an italic C with a 45 degree pen angle, which is the pen angle that you are taught to use. If I make an italic C with that pen angle and Sheila Waters makes an italic C with that pen angle and Alice makes an italic C with that pen angle, all of our C's will be different. And then if I write a line, all of them will be different because calligraphy is the most immediate expression of personality. It's like it's like everybody's handwriting. You know yeah. what, it's, it's like everybody's can, how face. How do you have a manual for your own handwriting? Well, how do you, when you learned to write mm -hmm. in school, yeah. didn't they show you an alphabet? How do you have an alphabet? But then it became your own handwriting, but you learned from an alphabet. Right. So, I mean, they give you the, uh, that's what I'm saying, this, in this oh, they manual, they give you the general basics. shapes. Definitely, yeah. And then you, but you have to put start in your from personality. There. Well, and your personality will come in inevitably, no matter what you do. But it has, that's, that's exactly what these manuals do. They give you the shapes. They'll have a, they'll tell you about pen angle. They'll tell you about, also, you shouldn't write like this on a flat surface. You should write on an angled surface. There's instruction about that about margins and you know you could every rule is made to be broken um, <laughs> and you could okay. break the rules right but but you need that basic if you don't learn those basics you'll never get anywhere just like if you don't learn the shapes of the letters and how are you going to learn this and then there are better shapes and worse shapes of letters so edward johnson would give you what he considered to be the ideal shape which he readily credits to a manuscript, you know, he'll say this is based on a 10th century manuscript in the British Museum. And so he says this is the best what? For legibility? Yes, legibility and beauty. And legibility. Beauty. Well, he had he had three criteria, but twice in his life he wrote three criteria for calligraphy, and they were different. And the first one was, <laughs> I should know these by, mm -hmm. legibility, beauty, and form. Uh, and then the th next time he wrote it, 20, 30 years later, it was sharpness and freedom. And, you know, he had these criteria that he boiled it down to, but they were different. But all of those six criteria, you know, freedom, beauty, sharpness was one of them. Legibility is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, but he also wrote, and Johnson was brilliant about these things. He wrote, our job is to make, a, make good letters and make them our own. That was very interesting because he was very historical and copying these models, but he always changed them and he said to make them our own, our job is to, actually, and his other very short synopsis of what calligraphy was, our job is to make beautiful letters and arrange them well. Yeah. That's true. And so when you do book design, you're taking beautiful letters and arranging them well. That's really what you're yeah. doing. But book design, to me, became, I feel is more of a challenge. I feel that book design uh, you know, I love calligraphy, as I said, but if you're doing a piece of calligraphy, you select maybe a style for the headline and a style for the body, maybe an initial, and you select one kind of paper that you're doing it on. When you do a book, you select the text paper and the end papers and the cover material, and you have to make a title page and chapter openings and, and captions, and you have to make them all go together. That's the real art of book design, mm -hmm. that you know, you could make a beautiful title page that doesn't go with the rest of the book. It's no right. good. So. To me, book design is more of a challenge, and I contend that Johnson and Koch, Koch actually said it, that the ultimate challenge for a calligrapher is to make a book, even if it's just eight pages and a cover. He said it in that, and so his manual, in that manual, the German, I will not butcher a second time. That was beautiful, actually. <laughs> really? Yeah, probably <laughs> terrible. But um, he, he said in there the ultimate challenge for a calligrapher is to make a book. So he has this book of instruction where he gives you the letter forms, the pen angle, he shows the stroke sequence that these books have, which stroke you make first. And when you're a beginner, this is very important. And then at the end of the book, though, he has instructions on how to make a manuscript book, saying that this is the ultimate challenge. And Johnson has instructions on making books, too. And so what do they say about making books? Margins and, you know, consistent margins and the proportion of the margins. And that's, uh, I'm trying to 
trying to remember, you know, I've read these books very, very sure, long ago. Sure. But but I do see in my mind's eye these pictures of margins in the area. Mm. You know, when it, there's a certain formula about one, two, three, four for margins, the smallest margin on the inside, the top margin is twice that, the the outer margin one and a half times that top margin and the bottom margin twice. So those kind of formulas they give in their book. You know, the basic instructions on how to make a book. And these formulas are based on their experience of hundreds and thousands of books and this is what they've decided works best for them. Well, that's a very interesting way to put it. I'd say that hundreds of thousands of books have been made that evolved into these proportions and they are just, they would have said, Johnson especially, that we are relating what we see in medieval books and renaissance books and it's true but these developed and it's like um, it's like the proportions of well I was going to say a building but that may not be the best analogy mm -hmm. that there are beautiful proportions and ugly proportions and they kind of evolve so if you see the Parthenon you, yeah. you, you, the proportions are just amazingly beautiful well mm. somebody figured those out very carefully I'm thinking of the Nautilus as well that's right that's yeah. right and there are diagrams that people have done where they show how the page how the proportion of margins you see in this diagram I can tell by the way you're not yeah, yeah. where the margins are related to that Nautilus and there's the golden section you know if yeah. you look most books look at this notebook you have here if you measure this it's going to be very close to or will be the golden section and you give people a book you know square books are actually very uncomfortable you'll see yeah. them and oblong oh, yeah. books are an interesting thing there are a lot of oblong books that are fine but really a golden section vertical book and if you measure this I, this is really it's not I could see that this is not two to three which is the easy the golden section is one to one point six four one six something like okay. so it's a little it's a little taller than two to three and that looks a little taller than two to three for me right. so why and that's you know, what makes a, a Beethoven piano sonata beautiful? That this is the, you know, really esoteric part of it. Mm -hmm. Why can you play it to someone in Montreal and someone in China and both of them find it beautiful? Well, there's something inside of us that goes for these beautiful, yeah. har harmonious arrangements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, interesting. Uh, your book, uh, A Century for the Century, which actually was, was published by uh, David R. Godin and the Grolier Club. We're at the Grolier Club right now. You take responsibility for the second half of the 20th century, the 50 books. And in order for you to do that, you have to exercise judgment. So that's what I want to focus in on here. First of all, you say that 36 out of the 50 published were by fine presses on their own behalf, at their own expense, not commissioned, rather than commercial work. So why is that? Well, I would say because a book artist, given the freedom to do what they want to do, seems to produce the most successful work. Mm -hmm. um, so, in other words, they're, like, they put so much work and effort into it that it's not even commercially viable. Well, that, that's, that's, a good, that's an interesting way of putting it, too. Uh, yes, that's part of it. But also, they pick the text, they pick the paper. Mm -hmm. But, yes, I, like, I have a private press of my own, too, in the basement of my house where I print little things. And, you know, I do all these books. What's it called? It's called the Kelly Winterton Press. Okay. And... When I do, if I do a book for a customer, and let's say I want to use a paper that's too expensive, they could say no. And but on my private press, I could do whatever I want. You know, when people are, and and so, but that's the whole private press movement. You know, when William yeah. Morris started doing his book, I'm sure no publisher in England or anywhere else would have paid him to make the books that he wanted on handmade paper with ink imported from Germany, cutting his own typeface. Nobody would have supported that and he had an idea, idea of what a beautiful book should be and he did that. Same thing with Cobden Sanderson. So the interesting thing to me and the reason why I quoted that statistic is that even 50 years after Morris, yeah. uh, that was still the way many, 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 many and one can even argue the majority of fine printing was being done by people who just did what they wanted to do, what they thought was the ideal book without the restrictions of an author, a publisher, an editor. 
well, and you're saying that that this sort of restriction-free practice results in the most beautiful books. Many times, but there are yeah. still those 14 books that mm. had the restrictions. Yeah. Um, uh, Morris's overriding concern was for the quality of materials, paper, binding, and ink, a high level of craftsmanship in composition and press work. So these are criteria that you use, I'm guessing, to determine what's the most beautiful book. The most beautiful book, the main criteria in a way is an aesthetic one, isn't mm -hmm. it? it? That, oh, that's a beautiful title page, that's a beautiful binding, that, that all goes together beautifully. And then I would say the craftsmanship and the quality of composition all serve that goal to make a beautiful object. It's a beautiful object. So mm -hmm. to say that a piece of furniture that's, you know, you say, oh, that's beautiful. Well, the fact that the carving of the, you know, edge is very beautifully done serves that overall beautiful. So it's aesthetic. It's an aesthetic thing, a beautiful book. And it's subjective. I willingly admit I that, that, that it's, the... it's subjective. And I, we are giving you our opinion in this book. Of, yeah. You know, we consulted with some people. They're listed in the beginning of the book who, who looked over the list and made some suggestions. But it's subjective. It's not a democratic selection. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact is that you, first of all, have the practice. You've actually done this. You've experienced it. You've read a lot about it. About it and you've what? Looked at a lot of books. You've looked at a lot of books. You've honed your taste. Well, I hope so. I hope so. But isn't that, you know, everything is cultivated. You know, you would say a cultivated taste. Well, cultivation is doing it a lot, looking at it a lot. Mm -hmm. So, so, so uh, as I say, that's why I'm interested in asking, because, because you are who you are, I'm interested in asking you why you have the taste you have. Well, I would say a lot of it is study. I'm, very, I'm a very historically minded designer, much more than most calligraphers or book designers, although I think all of them have some historical sense of looking at what had been done, but I'm very historically minded, so I've read a lot, and I, but I've looked at a lot of books. I would say the most thing, you know, to you know, there's that um, Malcolm Gladwell, mm -hmm. Ten Thousand Hours. Yeah, you know that. Okay, yeah. and I mentioned that in the Zaff book, like trying to hone in on where this, this enormous is what, talent. This is your most recent book, right? It's not. There's well, actually one that came out a few weeks ago on type revivals okay. but this is the one before that and on, it's a it, we call it a biography of Herman Zaff yes that's yeah, right. okay. it's a biography of Herman that's what it says okay. on the spine Herman right. Zaff a biography it, is, yeah. it does have a different subtitle on yeah. the title page okay. but, but when I was doing that and I was trying to hone in as you say on where this enormous talent came from and one of the things is the amount of work he did and I, we, I mentioned Gladwell's book The 10,000 Hours you know he refers to the Beatles having played in Hamburg so intensely right. and yeah. that this is what created this enormous talent and Zaff did a tremendous amount of manuscript books, spent a tremendous amount of time. So I think spending a lot of time looking at examples and studying them and reading about them. Zaff makes, didn't do as many drugs as the Beatles did though. Right? I don't think so. No, that's right. That's right. There you go. Yeah, maybe some amphetamines would have kept him going even further, but that's right. I, I doubt it. Knowing, knowing Zaff, I doubt it. Uh, there are differences. Sure. Okay. This might touch on what we were talking about, how there are the, the sort of pra traditional practices and with the calligraphy you're know, overlaying your own personality onto it. You refer to Daniel Updike and uh, Rogers as elusive typography. Mm -hmm. What's that? Elusive typography is taking a book from the past, a certain typographic style or book design, and adapting it for a book you're doing today. So when Rogers did a book on Fra Luca di Pacioli, published by the Groyer Club, which is considered one of his most beautiful books, the borders for that book and the initial are taken from a 16th century edition of Pacioli, which he retouched and printed in red instead of black. He, he did all kinds of things to, as Johnson said, take from the past and make it our own. He, yeah. But um, a lucid typography refers to that, whereas other typographers, by contrast, some typographers, such as Zaff or Jan van Krimpen, great masters also, always wanted to do something modern, something new of our time. They yeah. didn't believe really in copying the past the way that, um, uh, that Rogers and Updike 
were great believers in basing uh, their work on things done in the past, sometimes quite directly. As a matter of fact, you'll see in a century for century, I'm sure you saw that I re reproduced in the introduction a book or two where I showed a 16th century book and then what Rogers did with it in the 20th century. So they quite directly would copy elements of the past and make a modern, beautiful book out of it. Yeah, after 1949, the drive was to develop contemporary aesthetic an attempt a contemporary aesthetic in the book arts using contemporary types in novel ways to create books that were modern and of their time yet beautiful and legible that's you yeah I'm surprised I picked 1949 I forgot maybe because I was writing the second half but yeah but because let's say the Bauhaus from the 20s and 30s mm -hmm. that there they would never take some 16th century ornament and put it into a modern book you know, they were also trying to create contemporary new. Of course, to some of us, the trouble with the Bauhaus is that that would get pretty wacky, really, and pretty eccentric, you yeah. know, going overboard, trying to create something new. Yet, there were some very beautiful Bauhaus books. I'm not saying everything. So, yeah. well, but and certainly they weren't necessarily commercial either because of that. That's right. Although there were commercial yeah. Bauhaus designs too. So, um, yeah, 1949, it's, it's, that's not really right to pick such a hard date. But I would say that uh, Rogers and Updike and Morrison and Maynard had tremendous influence and there was a lot of elusive typography before the Second World War mm -hmm. and there was more attempts at contemporary, even though there were attempts at being modern before the Second World War and there's elusive typography after the Second World War, but it was much more pushed towards modern design. Uh, as far as criteria for greatness, uh, and again, we're talking about a century for the century, the book uh, published by Godin and the Groyer Club. All type, except for one uh, polymer-plated one, and we're talking about the 50 books that you were looking at, were cast in metal from matrices for relief letterpress printing in the same way that books had been produced since the mid 15th century. So your criteria for beauty greatness is type cast in metal? No. That is an observation, not a criteria. I was I was actually surprised by that. Yeah. That I expected to, and there is no offset book from phototype and they're trying to think maybe not um, I, I was surprised by that I expected more offset books more phototype and we made this list without a technical criteria so I was surprised at that uh, but no I do not feel I feel there are beautiful books that are set phototype and digital type okay. and printed offset but that's an observation not a, not a criteria okay a few more observations than the, uh, the the number of them that were printed by hand and set by hand. Surprising too that yeah. that that was still s surviving and so many books were done that so many of the most beautiful books of the century were done that way. I think that's surprising. Yeah, I mean, if it's an observation, but isn't it also a, a kind of retroactive criteria because that's what you chose? That's an interesting point and. It's hard to argue with. I do feel that if I were to pick now the greatest books of the past 20 years, yeah. well, maybe I'd surprise myself. Maybe maybe there would be a lot of handset or metal type, and a lot, maybe there would be, because we didn't pick them with this criteria. But once we picked them and I started to look at how many were letterpress, how many were metal type, how many were handset, I was surprised how many. I mean, there's very beautiful work being done with digital type today and offset printing. I believe that printing is better today than it's ever been in the history of the world. That if you go to Barnes & Noble and look at the average book, it's much better printed than any time in the history of printing. It's much more evenly printed. The registration will be perfect. This used to be tough for printers to get it to back up and register. The technology now is so good that it's better printed than ever. If we could just look at some of the, the giants that you refer to in the book uh, and get your take on them. Jan Chickold. A brilliant typographer. He's very famous for having been a Bauhaus typographer. He was never a member of the Bauhaus, never taught at the Bauhaus, but he was a major proponent of the radical asymmetric typography and sans serif typefaces. 
And he's famous for having done a complete turnaround and become very conservative later in life. He went from being a radical yeah. youth to conservative. He did the Penguin? He did the Penguin redesign. He was, yeah. he was hired by Alan Lane of Penguin Books on Oliver Simon suggestion to redesign their paperbacks and did a great job and he was succeeded by some people who did a great job too and when he was at Penguin he famously wrote these composition rules. Penguin was using a lot of different typesetters and printers and he went to Penguin and he saw this mishmash of bad typography and he wrote a set of rules that is something of a bible for I think every good book designer since. Oh it's very short, it's a four page pamphlet. It's been reprinted many times and um, he spoke about tight spacing and even spacing and all kinds of things about setting up books. He did that when he was at Penguin. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting. To me, Chickel, there's a consistency between his radical Bauhaus style work and his conservative work and that was this care in typesetting. You talked about that earlier, about these little details. And, mm -hmm. and he always had beautifully spaced type was always very important to him. The spacing between letters and the careful placement on the page and these composition finesse that he had uh, was always important whether he was doing his Bauhaus work or his modern work. You're going to have to help me on the pronunciation here. Max Kaflisch, Kaflisch, Kaflisch. who was a student of Chickold's, as a matter of fact, in Switzerland. Uh, he's interesting too. Um, he did beautiful work, modern, elusive, conservative. All, all of those styles are in his work. I, I actually feel that way about my work too. I feel like I don't follow this elusive style like Rogers or Updike would have, or this radical style like the early Chickold. Um, you know, to me, there's a large variety of ways to make a book. And Max Kaflisch made beautiful books many different ways. He did a lot of commercial work. He did some private press work that was, you know, limited on handmade paper with handset type, but, but he did commercial runs of a lot of huge runs, so mm -hmm. so he uh, had a wide range in his work. Victor Hammer. Well, Victor Hammer was the opposite of that. He, had, he did not have a wide range at all. He had a very rigid, specific uh, way of doing books. All of his books were handset, metal type printed on a hand press. I don't think he ever did a book that was printed. All of it was hand work. He, he was very much in the Morris vein of craftsmanship. And he even built his own presses. But his books Sophia said a lot of these guys are really good with their hands. And Hammer and they, was. Yeah. Yes, Victor Hammer was really good with his hands. I don't know about Catfish. Chickle did some lettering. You could see that he had that skill. Yeah. Hammer was a tremendous craftsman, yes. He did. He was a painter also and did some sculpture and hand-carved lettering too. Mm. So he had tremendous hand skills and craftsmanship. But he had a very specific aesthetic and what part of it was that he believed that Unschel letter forms were the most beautiful. And you could see it in the book, an example. It's would be considered quite an eccentric typeface today and hard to read. His contention was that if everything were printed in Unschel, you'd find it easy to read. It's just so infrequently. Yeah, that's right. Okay. That it's just so infrequent. But he had a very different aesthetic than Catfish or Chickold. Variety is the spice of life. Well, it's funny. Uh, I, I just interviewed Chip Kidd yesterday, the book dust jacket designer, and it's just so difficult to Point pigeon pinpoint. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he's just... And he, he does all sorts of covers. Yeah. So, uh, and that's that's what he wants. Yep. Dard Hunter. Well, Dard Hunter is another fascinating person. He was really most interested in paper making. That was his. So, yeah. so the book in a century for century is uh, paper making in America. And he's fascinating because he was another craftsman who did a lot with his hands. So he may be the only man in the history of the book who made the paper, cut his own typeface. Other people designed their own, but he mm. cut his own typeface, something Victor Hammer did also. He printed himself on a hand press, and he even bound books himself. So he may be the only person who brought all those skills together. Is that uh, why you chose the book? No. It is a beautiful book, and it's kind of gutsy. I was going to say crude. His type is a little crude. Uh, but it, it all comes together as this beautiful personal expression of craftsmanship. And it is a beautiful book. So it wasn't chosen because he did all these. But 
uh, it's something that's very interesting in the history of the book that perhaps only one man brought all those skills together. Morris never cut his own types. Morris never printed a book himself. Uh, mm -hmm. But he designed type and he selected the papers. And things. But, but Dart Hunter did it all. Leonard Baskin. Leonard Baskin, I think, is one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. And I think time will be very kind to Mr. Baskin. I think one day the art world will catch up with him, even though he had a good deal of popularity as a fine artist. But he did lithography and etching and painting, beautiful watercolors, he illustrated books, but he had he started his own private press. So in love with books was Mr. Baskin, that he did these books on his own press. He hired a pressman, he bought the equipment, rented the space, and made books the way he saw fit and um, did some beautiful, beautiful books. Baskin did one or two offset books that he published under his Gehenna Press imprint. Mm -hmm. He designed many books that were offset. Did he, work, he worked with Godin, right? Or did Godin, Godin worked work with, with Baskin. Him? Godin <laughs> worked at Baskin's shop for right. a little while, and some of the earliest David Godin books were actually, with his imprint, were actually printed at the Gehenna Press. Yeah. Um, so Baskin came first. You referenced the uh, Plantin Press as an example of how a commercial press can aspire uh, to the level of a fine press. Definitely. And of course, Updike at the Merriman Press was famous for this. Mm -hmm. Updike was a, com the Merriman Press was a commercial operation that really, they may have been the first or one of the first to aspire to do work as fine as the private presses. So the Plant and Press saw Marx did beautiful work in Los Angeles and the quality was every bit as good as fine press printing. And he did some publications on his own too, uh, you know, under the Plant and Press imprint, some of his finest. We have in there the presses of the Pacific Isles and he published that himself, used mold made paper that he wanted, did all the finicky typography he was famous for, mm. uh, but he was a commercial operation and did beautiful commercial work. I'm putting in mind of Francis Maynell as well. That's right, but Francis Maynell was completely, had, a, had but that's a good analogy, but he was a publishing operation. He started a commercial publishing operation with the goal of producing books to the aesthetic of the fine press movement using different presses. He really didn't have his own shop. You see, the Planet no. Press was a printing shop. I see. Maynell did print a couple of books, a couple of the Nonsuch Press books, but the small ones he printed himself. But yeah. But the Planet Press was a shop that was taking commissions. Maynell was not taking commissions. Maynell, you could not go to Francis Maynell and say, I want to do a book of my mother's poetry. Will you design and print it for me? No, he was publishing those books. The Planet Press, you have a book of your mother's poems and you want it. That was his business. Mm -hmm. And also museums were going to him and others. Right. Commercial presses that aspire to the level of fine presses. There's a couple in Canada that uh, that I'm uh, quite familiar with. There's the Gasparo Press in Nova Scotia. Beautiful work. They, they do beautiful work. Gasparo is a model for us all today of how <laughs> fine press. Andrew Steves, mm. who you probably know, Thank and, you. Yeah. and um, I admire they work tremendously, and they have a letter, they do letterpress covers sometimes. They have a letterpress they where do, they will yeah. print the covers. They, they do the offset. Uh, oh, and they have the machines too. They yeah. do their own offset, and beautifully done. But the design is beautiful. The books he do, he does are beautiful, and he's making a go of it as a commercial publisher. Mm. Godin started that way. Godin was actually printing and publishing his own books, but decided he had to go one way or the other. He and he went into publishing instead yeah. of printing. Yeah. But Gaspar is doing it all, and the. The quality of the design, I think, is really top-notch. And Anyone uh, else in North America or England that's uh, doing something similar that you're aware of? Well, the Whittington Press, our publishers, they, they are very... They're, they're, yeah, but I would classify them as fine press. Yes, they are fine I'm, press. I'm looking at commercial... Well, what about David Godin? Mm -hmm. He maintains a very high standard, I yeah. believe, yeah. in the books he's doing. So, yes, I would put him in that, but he's a little more towards the publishing and wide distribution than Gaspro. And Whittington, yes, is a little more towards the fine press, but he's still, Whittington is still a publisher who's initiating their own texts by different authors and work. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But he, they are a fine press. But, yes, Andrew, he's, you know, Coffee House Press used to be like that, and yeah. North Point, but both of them... Well, the founder of Coffee House, Alan Kornblum, I believe yeah. he died, right? Yeah. And yeah. I don't 
think the press is still going. Or is I think it, it is. Still it's still going. going. Mm-hmm. And North Point was bought by another publisher, but North Point was doing beautiful. North Point was. Do you know their work? No, at, I don't. At, at Where the West Coast, from? the West Coast. Okay. And they were doing very good books, very well designed. You know, Black Sparrow is an interesting issue. I, you know, about Black Sparrow book, and you know they were often using letterpress covers and multiple colors that you know publishers would never pay for. Um, so they were interesting attempts. So there are others. There yeah. definitely are. These, uh, again, for someone who doesn't have a huge amount of money, these would be, I think, really good. Yes, presses to go after, and uh, definitely. Although some of the early Godin books go for a lot of money, yeah. But yes, but some don't. I mean, some the don't. Poetry books definitely. You can get for definitely, you could get. Uh, there's a book that Godin did early on called Specimen Days that he published at Lancet. Yeah, Beautiful book. I'm mm-hmm. sure you could find a copy for twenty dollars. Yes. Beautiful book. Yeah. It was hand set in metal, not hand set, set on the monotype machine and hand set on metal. Beautifully printed Dewey Tone. Very yeah. interesting book, Walt Whitman's, Walt Whitman's Diary yeah. of the Civil War. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sure you can find that for $20, and it's a beautiful book. There was another book they did of gardens that's in the century for century, and that one, they only did 50 copies, and if, it would be very hard to find at a low price. But yes, it would be, I think it would be very worthwhile to collect, or oh, Gasparo to collect it completely. There's the Luxpur Press. Have you come across them? Gasparo did their bibliography. He's in Kentucky. Yeah. All of his books are handset and printed letterpress and beautifully printed. The craftsmanship is wonderful and very good taste and type. And, you know, you can find most of those for a very low price. He did um, some very famous authors, Wendell Berry, he published, yeah. and Thomas Merton. So some of the books are pricey because they're first edition of certain authors yeah. that are very collected. That's the trick, isn't it? You go to the press, you don't go for the big names, you go for the unknown names sure. and you get the same quality book. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. If you're after the book aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. Here uh, again, what I think are some criteria that you have identified, or I have anyway, in your, in your text of a century for the century, and that is a microscopic care dexterity in combining papers, typefaces, illustrations, readability, sensitivity to author's words, fresh new approaches, respect for tradition but breaking boundaries or barriers. Yeah. Those are criteria. That's good. I would I would say those are criteria, not observations. Okay. I would say those are criteria, yes, for, for, for what beautiful you, books, yeah. for beautiful contemporary books, yes. Better types employed in better ways. That was Morrison, I think, who said that. Did he say that? Yeah, I like that. I like that, yeah. I am very finicky about typeface selection, and there are a lot of good typefaces today. Again, as I said, the printing today is better than ever. There are more good typefaces available to designers today than ever. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are more bad typefaces available today than ever also. And a little bit of taste, and you should be able to pick the former rather than the latter. Anything else you want to say uh, before we leave uh, Century for the Century? Well, we didn't talk about the main impetus for that book, Mm -hmm. and that was that the 20th century was drawing to a close, and it's my contention that the most beautiful books ever printed, uh, overall, that the 20th century had more beautiful books than any other century. There were beautiful books in the 15th century, beautiful books in the 16th century, the 17th century could be a little tough. Mm. Uh, The 19th century had beautiful books, Pickering as an example. But in the 20th century, the beautiful printing done in the 20th century, I think, was more than any other century. And I thought there should be some kind of documentation of this or, or, you know, touting the horn of the century that produced so much beautiful printing and beautiful books. So that was the impetus for it. Mm-hmm. And I got my friend Martin Hutner to work with me on the project, at an exhibition here at the Grey Club, and, and a book about that. Uh, speaking of Pickering, William Pickering, I, I've had this book of yours for some years. I, I love this little book. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. It is a checklist of the books published by William Pickering, 1820 to 1853. 
beautiful paper. What kind of paper did you use? Well, it's actually a machine-made paper called Teton that I just found out it has stopped being made just now. They stopped making this paper, but it's it's a very nice machine-made paper, uh, not a mold made or handmade. It was made in a mill here in America. This book is dedicated to the memory of Philip Sperling. Who is that? Phil Sperling was a friend of mine who worked here at the Groyer Club for a while as a volunteer, a true book lover, passionate about beautiful books, and most passionate about Pickering, and he built up a very large Pickering collection, and I would visit him. He lived in the East 20s, and I would visit him, and he would show me his books and explain about Pickering. And he collected other things, too. He collected modern private presses. He had Herman Zapp books and Bruce Rogers books, but Pickering was his passion. And so he educated me a bit about passion and uh, a bit about passion, a bit about Pickering. <laughs> that was Don't need question. education. <laughs> no, <laughs> no yeah. a bit about Pickering. Well, it helps, though. It <laughs> yes, it, helps. it does. Yeah, <laughs> it does. <laughs> yeah Pickering, uh, people that love Pickering really love him, don't they? they uh, he's, he, he, he made unpretentious, clear, clean, forceful, elegant. Um, well, some of his books were very pretentious. Did I use, I hope I didn't use the word I don't know if it was you, but it's in there somewhere. Well, no, he... Did. You had a number of people here, though. You had Blue, uh, Joseph Blumenthal. And right. Maybe, the, I'm not sure where I got that from, but uh, well, it's in one, here somewhere. One of the fascinating things about Pickering is his range, the range of books he did. So he did unpretentious books. He did many... Well, the but, Aldine uh, Yeah, the Aldine series. Poets. The Aldine yeah. Poets were unpretentious books, but he did lots. You, most of his books were, um, were not pretentious, but... He did these um, very elaborate facsimiles of the Book of Common Prayer, six books, type facsimiles of six books of Common Prayer, and then the new 1844 Book of Common Prayer printed on beautiful paper and black letter types in two colors throughout. Those were very elaborate productions, and he did these illustrated books about, well, one of them is Dresses and Decorations of the Middle Ages, another one is on Alphabets mm -hmm. and Illuminations, and they were There's very... color in those, right? Those are yeah. color, hand-colored. Yeah. yeah. The deluxe editions had gold. Wow. You could use the word pretentious for those. <laughs> but he did also... That's the amazing thing and why I'm so interested in Pickering in many ways, the mm -hmm. range of books he did. But also, he did beautiful book design when at a time when there wasn't much beautiful book design being done. This is not like yes. the 20th century, a century right. for the century, when there was so much good work. At Pickering's time... Uh, there was a lot of very poor work. Yeah. And he... Victorian. Victorian England. Yeah. And he... Uh, which he... Is it pre-Victorian? I would say it's 18... When did Victoria... It 1853 is. is when Pickering... Left and, the scene. Yeah. She... Well, it's around about that time. Because she... I know she, she died in 1901. Right. So I think she would have ascended to the throne about, about the time that he... Well, he died in 58, I believe. I'm trying to, or did he die in 53 and the press went on until 58? I, but, I guess what I'm getting at, though, is this sort of industrialization yeah, that's of right. production. That's and right. The, that's right. The, the, as yeah, and very weak typefaces. Yeah. He, he spearheaded the revival of Caslon fonts, supposed to these very thin, weak fonts that were being used mainly at the time. And he, he went out of his way to use good printers, the Chiswick Press especially, though he used other printers. And he had a very good sense of design. He designed books beautifully. Mm -hmm. But also, the other thing that's so fascinating about Frick is his editorial taste, too, combined with that sense of design. He published the first typeset book of William Blake's poetry, when William Blake was nobody. He did John Donne, uh, Coleridge. Yeah. He did the first English edition of Immanuel Kant. He did the first edition in English of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales. Yeah. So aside from his aesthetic taste, which of course appeals to me as a book designer, his editorial selection was phenomenal. Yeah. Are there any uh, good biographies that you can recommend? Of him? No. Um, somebody's been working on one. The Incline Press, I heard, has been working on one being written by John Porter, a British collector who probably had the greatest collection of Pickering ever. And I don't know what's happened to that book. I've heard about that book for years. Have you, The Incline Press has probably crossed your radar. Anyway. It has, yeah. And, and Graham Moss, I heard, was working on publishing that, but that's been for years. There's very little written on Pickering. Jeffrey Kane's 
who is a famous bibliographer, mm-hmm. did did a checklist of Pickering books with, I don't know, maybe 20 pages of biography in the beginning. Uh, but there's no full-scale biography of Pickering. There should be. Okay. There's a lot of mythology around Pickering. I get into it in that book there. There are a lot of things that are said about him that are dubious, such as that he may have been a, an illegitimate child of royalty, and therefore he got the capital from his unknown father to start his business. This probably is not true. That he made a loan to a friend, this may be true early in his life, that was never repaid and that bankrupted him. There, there's a lot of mythology around him. It would be good to get a good biography. Mm-hmm. I try to go a little into these things in that book. Yeah, yeah. And try to set the record straight, but um, somebody should really do thorough research on Pickering and write a full-scale biography. He's certainly worthy of it. His his books are, aren't overly pricey. Some yes and some no. Yeah. If you want to get all done poets, you could pick those up very inexpensively. Yeah. Especially since it's a lot of time the condition isn't good. But if you want to get a copy, well, that William Blake book that I mentioned. Yeah. I yeah. think it, last time I saw it was $17,500. Does that sound overly pricey? Yeah. <laughs> What about the elements of Euclid? That looks well, that goes for yeah. over ten thousand dollars. That's yeah. a fascinating book because yeah. the use of color is yeah, is riotous. It's in that gorgeous, book. yeah. Yeah, but there are many, many books that you can get at Pickering's for twenty or thirty or forty dollars, and yeah, he'd be a good one to start collecting. But there are very expensive Pickering's also. Okay. Anything else about Pickering you want to say? Mainly to me, the amazing thing is that his tremendous aesthetic taste at a time when it was a barren wasteland. Today, if you have good taste and good design, there's a lot of good taste and good design around, but at the time Pickering was working in the mid-19th century in England, there was very little good taste. And his editorial taste and his publishing, the program of publishing so many books, probably around 1,200, 1,500 books of such high standards, is really admirable. It's interesting. You're saying that he uh, he was concerned about standards, and he he imposed some impressive new standards and practices. And yet, he you you know you carry on through the 1800s uh, to the time of uh, William Morris. I don't know if he had the same kind of influence that Morris did. I would say not. I would say he was not as revolutionary as Morris, and did yeah. not have the same influence. But there's a famous line buried deep in something Bruce Rogers wrote when he was at the Riverside Press, and he said that his bosses at the Riverside Press thought that a good book was something that looked like a Pickering. That was the only that was their you know definition of a good book. It right. looked like a Pickering book. Yeah. So, um, so maybe the wider culture wasn't aware. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So Henry, gee, Henry Mifflin, Henry Houghton, no, George Mifflin, and Henry Houghton of Houghton Mifflin yeah. of the Riverside Press saw Pickering, but they were educated men of great taste, and right, his wider influence was was much less, you're right. He did have an influence on Rogers and Updike early yeah, on, yeah. so did Morris. But Morris was more revolutionary and had a greater influence, I'd have to say that. Speaking of uh, which, uh, what about Herman Zaff? He's had a tremendous influence. Like what? Well, as far as calligraphy goes, it's hard to think of a calligrapher who would not cite Zaff as a major influence on the uh, calligraphers? You know, the finest calligraphers today, such as Julian Waters and John Stevens, both have said that their greatest influence was Herman Zaff. And as far as type design goes, his influence was tremendous. Let's look at the calligraphy then. Well, I mentioned earlier Edward Johnson and Rudolf Koch as spearheading the revival of calligraphy early in the 20th century. And their work was very free and direct, very beautiful. Uh, Koch, by the way, was a mentor to Zaff. He was a tremendous influence on Zaff. But Zaff professed, let's say, a a more refined style, more finished, and that has been a tremendous influence on calligraphy today, that there's much more of this, and and modern. He he would believe in something more contemporary looking, not as backward looking as Johnson, who was copying these manuscripts. Yet Zaff was very traditional in his way. So calligraphy today, most calligraphers today, you could see the influence of Zaff's philosophy of more refinement, more consistency, less historical. And 
even specifically, you know, he did a writing manual called Pen Engraver in 49. It was first published in the 50s. And you look at Calligrapher's work today and you see a lot of letter forms that are based on that. And I'm sure, as I said, you know, the best calligraphers today always cite him as an influence, his work and the kind of letters that he wrote, the, the look of his letters. Uh, as a book designer, which was one of his main fields, less influential, he, he worked almost exclusively, or 90% perhaps, in books printed in German in Germany. Mm, and yeah. British and American book designers are not that great at looking at books not printed in English. But he's had a tremendous influence on my work. And, but as a type designer, his influence yeah. is tremendous. And his kind of balance of calligraphy and typography, of calligraphic influence on his typefaces is very effectual to what came after him. Yeah, and he taught at uh, Rochester mm -hmm. for right. 10 years, right? right? right. Thereabouts. So, that, so obviously that people, a lot of people must have gone through his... It was our pilgrimage. I went, <laughs> yes, I went, uh, I held the record. I went eight, <laughs> eight of the nine years. He, it was over the course of 10 years he taught from yeah. 70, 79 to 89 or 88. And one year he didn't go because of health reasons. And I went to eight of the nine classes. Julian Waters is second with seven of the nine <laughs> classes he attended. And yes, a lot of us went on our pilgrimage to study with the master, yes. Mm -hmm. and, and he had an influence as a teacher, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Anything else on exactly what his main influence was? Right. Well, definitely typeface design. You know, typeface is so ubiquitous, so calligraphy, is a, still a rarefied art yeah. and how much calligraphy do we see day to day but typefaces you see every day and it's amazing the amount of his type out there if you pick up any newspaper or magazine there will be ads set in his typefaces and, and what the major ones would be Bell Palatino Optima Zaffino which, yeah. and this is one of the other amazing things about Zaff Palatino was designed in 1948 and it was his first great major hit let's say he mm. did some very beautiful typefaces before that but Palatino was the one that really had such widespread recognition and use mm -hmm. still to this day. Mm -hmm. 1948. Zaffino, which you see everywhere, is 1998, 50 years uh -huh. later. Well, he actually, was, you say that you met him when he was 60, and he had, 30, half, he had half his, his working, working life ahead of him. It's I just, given my age, I love to hear that. <laughs> right. Really. right. I, yes. But it, it's amazing that he had an, So when I met him in 79, um, Zafina was 19 years in the future. And um, yeah. And so what, what is it like the, the, these faces, what they do? What, did, like, what was so different and why was it so adopted like this? What makes the Moonlight Sonata a popular piece of music? Okay. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had to give a, I, I gave a lecture recently on Zaff's typefaces, and I was actually talking about the specific deci some decisions he made and changes he made in these typefaces. Okay. If you look at the early proofs and how they change, and and these very slight changes that make for a successful typeface. What, like a bit thinner here. A oh, bit he had a there. T in Palatino, the original cap T had a serif only on the left of the crossbar, no serif on the right, this kind of calligraphic look and yeah. things like that. Very small changes that make for a successful typeface. And I, and I said during this lecture, I said, so what is it that makes for this change and makes an artist want to make this change? And I said, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Yeah. And how it's do genius. you... It's genius. It's genius, right. Yeah. And how do you qualify or quantify? So, the, but the beauty of his types is like the beauty of a beautiful painting or a beautiful piece of music or we could say a beautiful building. The yeah. the beauty of it is hard to... It's undefinable. Right, undefinable. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, if we could uh, finish off then. I want to put your good taste to use here for uh, aspiring uh, collectors, book collectors and existing ones. We, we talked about uh, Gaspro Press and uh, Coffee House and uh, was it North Point? North it? Point. North Point. Uh, just Luxpour, Luxpour. Luxpour is more of a Lux private press, so yes, that may be that's right. one more collectible yeah. than North Point, which was more of a commercial. Commercial, but mm -hmm. even, even so. Uh, even so, there are yeah. beautiful books, yes. Yeah. So that's it. How do we find 
in your opinion, the best, most beautiful books for the least price? Look at a lot of examples and see what you think is beautiful. But look at a lot of examples. It's like cultivating taste. It's Yeah, I don't want that answer, though. I want your opinion. Well, let me say one more thing that may not directly affect that. But I never took a class in book design or typography or graphic design in my life. I took classes in calligraphy. But what I did do was I used to go to the New York Public Library, rare book room, got mm -hmm. a reader's card, and I looked at pre I looked at examples. I would go three lunch hours a week when I worked on 38th Street and New York Public Library was on 42nd Street. And I'd look at these presses I had heard of and one would lead to another and I'd look at this and look at that. And that's how I think you develop taste and cultivate taste, by looking at a lot of examples. So I don't know if that answers your question, really. You want me to actually give you specific things, specific presses that I admire? And, or, or yeah, that, that, uh, <laughs> and maybe it's going against exactly what a collector should do, which is, as you said, is cultivate their own taste. That's the most important yes. message. But what I'm get, trying to get at is just utilizing all the work that you've done and getting some some ideas of what you well, think are undervalued or just a, a, a nice inexpensive way of getting in the game, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, not mm -hmm. going to libraries, but getting in the game. Okay, well maybe that's an easy question to answer because if you take a century for a century, yeah. and there's another book, I don't know if you saw my book called The Art of the Book in the 20th Century, no. where I take 11 book designers, Chickle, Zav, Rogers, Updike, Kaflish, Magister, and I have essays on all 11 of the examples of their work. So if you were to take those two books, perhaps, <laughs> and look at examples in there, yeah. and search on the internet, I bet you could find a lot of those books. I did a book, another book that's a little outside of this, called The Best of Both Worlds. It was about finely printed Livre d'Artiste, these artist books, but they were also finely printed. And it was a Groyer Club exhibition, and David Godin co-published that book also with the Groyer Club. And David did something very interesting. There were 77 books in there, I think. And he went on the internet and he found that I think you could buy like half of them or more for less than $40, or so, which was amazing. Um, wow. Maybe, I, wow. maybe I got that number wrong. But he told what me... Name, what was the name of that book again? The Best of Both Worlds. The Best of Both Worlds. It was okay. published by Gobin. Okay. Um, and it was an exhibition of 77 artist books that were also finely printed. And he discovered just by going on the internet that a lot of them there was some limited edition club books those were yeah. good value for the money yeah. although there was a wide range in limited editions club between very beautiful books and some more mediocre books but they did some very very good books I, uh, I, no, I think I spent about 300 bucks on it but it was it was a limited editions club it was recommended to me by Walter Bashinsky mm -hmm. uh, yes Walter does beautiful work yeah yes. And it was, I think it was the, the Odyssey. It was a two volume, it might have been the Iliad and the Odyssey. With no illustrations. With no illustrations. A beautiful book, Jan van Krimpen. That's yeah. Jan van Krimpen. Beautiful, yeah. two beautiful books. Yeah. Beautiful. And very unusual for Limited Editions Club, especially the early, no illustrations. Almost every book yeah. they did was illustrated. I'd say out there, you know, hundreds of books. Maybe three of them didn't have illustrations, and those are two of the three. Uh, but they're beautiful, hand-set in Romane. The paper was specially yes. made for the book with four watermarks, the Limited Editions Club, the Enskede watermark where it was printed, and one and a, and a galley, a, uh, you know, the, for the Odyssey, a watermark of the Greek galley. Oh, right, okay. And, and, what was, and the paper maker. There were four watermarks. It was specially made for the book, but one referring to the title of the book, one referring to the printer, one referring to the paper maker. It's fantastic. Well, not all on the same page. No, no, definitely not. No, definitely not. Spread throughout, that, the, spread book. throughout the book. No, yeah, and it's signed by... Um, by Van Krimpen in his beautiful handwriting, his yeah, beautiful yeah. calligraphic handwriting. Yeah. Those are beautiful books. It's hard to find them in good condition because the binding, the, they were big heavy books in the cloth that's with right. wear pool. And plus the, the slipcase gets yeah. battered up. But still. The slipcase which... Who knows who made those slipcases? Because they don't really, they yellow, and, and the type on the slipcase is not the type in the book. So yeah. they were made somewhere else, probably. But they're beautiful books, yeah. And, okay, this is great. I think we're, we've got. Okay, uh, okay, I hope this was helpful. Good. Jerry, thanks. Thanks so much for your My time. My pleasure. Thank yeah. you.